Breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. On the final Mark Dolan tonight before September, my Mark Meets guest is boxing legend Chris Eubank Jr. We'll talk about his next big fight. We'll talk fame, money and that rather well-known father of his. In the news agenda, I'll be speaking to the author of a stunning new book from the States that suggests Michelle Obama is planning to run for president in 2024. Obama versus Trump? Who wins that battle? In the big question, speaking of battles, is Liz Truss the right choice for Britain? We'll speak to top Conservative insider Tim Montgomery and a notorious and iconic figure of British politics, former Chief Secretary to the Treasury under John Major, Jonathan Aitken. In my take at 10, our society does not appreciate older people. In my view, we should be rolling out the red carpet for the golden generation. And in my big opinion, in just three minutes' time, Salman Rushdie's attacker, and woke censors are on the same spectrum. British liberal values are under attack and we must fight to preserve them. I'll see you after the headlines with Bethany Elsie. Mark, thank you. Good evening. I am Bethany Elsie, here to bring you up to date from the GB Newsroom. Sir Salman Rushdie's son, Zafar, has said his father suffered life-changing injuries in a knife attack on Friday, but that his feisty and defiant sense of humour remains intact. The 75-year-old author of The Satanic Verses has been taken off a ventilator after being stabbed at a literary event in New York State. The man accused of attacking him, 24-year-old Hayley Matar, has pleaded not guilty to attempted murder and assault. A group of 70 charities are calling on the next Prime Minister to more than double support to help people with soaring energy bills. In an open letter, signatories, including Save the Children and Age UK, are warning that vulnerable people are facing a catastrophe in the winter. The government has already committed to giving the poorest households £1,200. Meanwhile, Labour is expected to call for the energy price cap to be frozen at just under £2,000 this autumn. Rishi Sunak says he plans to make Britain energy secure, including boosting North Sea gas production. The former Chancellor says he'd legislate to make the UK's energy independent by 2045 to prevent a repeat of the looming winter crisis. Well, businesses, business and energy minister Greg Hans told GB News a long-term plan is essential. But that's also why Rishi Sunak has laid out a comprehensive plan for energy security going forward, making sure we're energy independent uh, within a generation. You know, that takes a long time to make changes on energy. It takes a long time to commission nuclear power plants. It already takes 10 years or more to build an offshore wind farm. So you need to have a long-term plan as well. Rishi Sunak has got that in place. More than 20,000 migrants have crossed the English Channel in small boats so far this year. Government figures show 607 crossings were made just yesterday. In 2021, a total of just more than 28,000 people were recorded making the journey. The UK is braced for three days of yellow weather warnings for thunderstorms following this week's heat wave. The Met Office says there's a high risk of power cuts and flash flooding after days of hot and dry weather. Firefighters continue to tackle wildfires in Hull, Kent and Dorset today. Residents near Dartford Heath are being warned to avoid the area after a fifth wildfire there this year. 
and Dorset Fire Service are calling for an end to disposable barbecues following a huge blaze across Studland Nature Reserve. And it's not just here. In Spain, over one and a half thousand people have been urged to evacuate their homes as large wildfires sweep through the country. Around 300 firefighters have been sent to the northeast region to help battle the flames. Extreme hot weather has caused several wildfires to ravage other parts of Europe as well. You're watching GB News on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. Now let's get back to Mark. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. In the news agenda with my panel, should all shops be forced to take cash? Is renting appliances a good way to tackle the cost of living crisis? And should workplaces make more time for fun? My Mark Meets guest is boxing legend Chris Eubank Jr. We'll talk about his next big fight, fame, money and that rather well-known father of his. In the news agenda, uh, we'll be covering lots of stories, including a massive book that's been published in the United States. It's created a political storm. It suggests Michelle Obama is planning to run for president in 2024. Obama versus Trump? Who wins that battle? Find out more at 9.45. In the big question, speaking of battles, is Liz Truss the right choice for Britain? Is she your choice for Britain? Mark at GBNews.UK. We'll speak to top Conservative insider Tim Montgomery and a notorious and iconic figure of British politics, former Chief Secretary to the Treasury under John Major, Jonathan Aitken. In my take at 10, our society does not appreciate older people. In my view, we should be rolling out the carpet for the golden generation. Reacting to those stories and many more are my fantastic panel tonight of model, actress and singer Amy Day, legendary radio DJ Neil Fox and ethnographer and academic Lisa McKenzie. Now I want to hear from you throughout the show, mark at gbnews.uk and this programme has a golden rule. We don't do boring folks, not on my watch, I just won't have it. So there you go, a uh, big two hours to come, big debates, big guests and always big opinions. Let's start with this one. We are in a very dark place. A 75-year-old man gets stabbed 15 times, including in the liver, the neck and the abdomen, and potentially loses an eye for writing a book. Another author, the most successful writer of fiction since Charles Dickens and Agatha Christie, J.K. Rowling, gets told on social media that she's next. And she's used to that, having hired 24-7 security after pointing out the difference between a biological male and a biological female, one which any GCSE biology textbook will confirm with diagrams. Tom, have you got any diagrams? There you go. That's the, uh, the willy on the right, the willy winkle. He's a boy. And the lady garden on the left, that'll be a female. How did I only get a C in biology? Robbed. Meanwhile, the supposedly liberal arts festival, the Edinburgh Fringe, which has made stars of Peter Kay, Sarah Millican, Michael McIntyre and Frank Skinner, cancels a legendary Scottish comedian because of his problematic material. Here is the eye-wateringly hypocritical statement from the Pleasance Theatre, who are behaving like the modern-day Gestapo. They said that the Pleasance is a venue that champions freedom of speech. That's right, champions freedom of speech, and we don't censor comedians. They go on to say, whilst we acknowledge that the comedian Jerry Sadowitz has often been controversial, the material presented at his first show is not acceptable and does not align with our values. On what planet is cancelling a show, not censorship? They went on to say, in today's society, opinions such as those displayed on stage by Sadowitz are not acceptable. It surprises me that I have to explain to the management of this world-renowned comedy venue, who happen to be friends of mine, that the things comedians say on stage are not opinions, they're not views, they're jokes. And this decision to cancel the run of the wonderfully outrageous comedian Jerry Sadowitz is the ultimate joke. 
But it just reflects the hellish double standards of the cultural establishment. Jerry Sadowitz effectively plays a character of the most outrageous comedian who says unthinkable things. It's even how his show is marketed. The show's called Not For Everyone. And he advises you to have a drink before you go in, such as the amoral, nihilistic vitriol you'll be subjected to. He verbally vomits on the audience for an hour. That's the act. Free speech and indeed artistic expression are not safe in the hands of festivals like The Fringe or indeed event organisers like Nika Burns, who heads up the prestigious Edinburgh Comedy Awards, who said in 2019, I'm looking forward to comedy's future in the woke world. Well, if shows like Mock the Week and The Mash Report or anything to go by, it has no future at all. Both shows were recently cancelled due to crumbling ratings. Live at the Apollo will be next. When left unchecked, this toxic, narrow-minded, bullying, divisive ideology, previously known as extreme political correctness, or PC, will see books, comedy, music and art banished if it doesn't fit the prescribed narrative, follow the correct politics and adhere to this hellish new scripture, which, by the way, changes daily. As we saw with Gary Lineker a couple of weeks ago over the women's football bra joke, the woke crocodile will always eventually devour its own. These smug censors think that they're doing the right thing, but what they're actually doing is on the same spectrum as that appalling knifeman at the Salman Rushdie events. Not on anywhere near the same scale, I will grant you, but each in their own way is an attack on Western values. And the double standards of woke censors knows no bounds. Apparently, Jerry Sadowitz is a problematic comedian, but no doubt they'll be happily hosting Jimmy Carr with his jokes about the murder of millions of gypsies. And what about Frankie Boyle and his side-splitting routines about children with Down syndrome having shit haircuts, Katie Price being assaulted by her heavily disabled son, or what about his recent comedic fantasy of raping TV host Holly Willoughby? Let me be clear, I am a free speech absolutist, and Boyle and Carr's jokes are just that. They might be sick jokes, but they're jokes nonetheless. Uh, they don't mean the things that they're saying, they're pushing boundaries, that's what comedians do, and long may that continue. Carr and Boyle are geniuses, as is Sadowitz, which is why it's got to be a level playing field. And frankly, any art worth its salt is problematic. If your book, your song or your joke is problematic, it means you're doing it right. Think of the violence and brutality in Shakespeare's plays, the naughty sex of D.H. Lawrence, the blasphemy of Life of Brian, the drug message in the Beatles songs. And rap and hip hop are about as problematic as it gets, and I love it. And comedy, as the ultimate bellwether of free speech, is really just the art of saying things out loud that you're not supposed to say. Who did the Taliban go after first when they recaptured Afghanistan? It was popular comedian Nazir Mohammed, who had his throat cut, the price he paid for his satire. Let me cite the genius Victoria Wood, who said in terms of offensiveness and comedy, if it's offensive, it's not funny. If it's funny, it's not offensive. She's so right. Which is why the audience must decide. If Jerry Sadowitz's show was truly horrific, everyone would have walked out. On the occasion of his first controversial show, it was just a handful of illiberal woke types, too fragile to handle the rough and tumble of deliciously inappropriate, wildly offensive comedy. This insidious cancel culture is the thin end of the wedge, which has, in its logical extreme, the horrors that we saw meted out to Salman Rushdie in New York on Friday. And by trashing freedom of expression on our own shores, we vacate the moral high grounds and make it harder to stand up to political extremists who seek the destruction of all Western values. The only way that we defend this pincer movement against Western values, for which a generation of mainly young, young men gave their lives in two world wars, is to once again fight. That's right, we've got to fight. Illiberal toxic ideologies are all on the same spectrum. We defeated them in the past, most notably in the 20th century, with communism and fascism, and we must defeat them again. 
Cancel culture, as with all tyrannies, is dressed up as being for the common good. That's because censors always seem to have a reason for what they're doing. But in a free country, never an excuse. What's your view, Mark, at gbnews.uk? Let's get reaction from my all-star panel, model, actress and singer Amy Day, legendary radio and television broadcaster uh, Neil Dr Fox and ethnographer and academic Lisa McKenzie. Lisa, let me start with you. Uh, your reaction to the Jerry Sadowitz cancellation and the parallels between extreme uh, ideologies attacking authors and uh, woke comedy venues cancelling comedians? Well, I, th I think you've kind of summed it up there that, you know, what is comedy? What is it doing? It's pushing boundaries. What does art do? Art is supposed to push boundaries. It's supposed to be social commentary and we push boundaries. You know, I'm an academic, I work in universities. Um, and it is becoming increasingly difficult to push boundaries, to think through what is happening in society and to sort of be critical about that. It, I, I'll be honest. I think all of us, no matter what sort of sphere we're, we're working in or we are in, we are all finding there is censorship. You know, um, I mean, I've just been been cancelled by the anarchist book fair. <laughs> now you've been you've been cancelled by anarchists. <laughs> yes, I've I just... didn't. I didn't know they were that organised. <laughs> yeah, there's an anarchist book fair in September, uh, and I've done a book which is a, from a collective on working class people in uh, lockdown. And they've cancelled me in the book <laughs> for coming on GB News, actually. Is that right? Is it just because you've been on GB News, you've been cancelled? Yes, yeah, yeah, All right. yeah. And not because of the nature of the book? No, the book is basically I've published working class people's diaries throughout lockdown. Mm. And we've done it as a collective rather than a single person. Yeah. Um, and yeah, they've, they've said that I'm not welcome. And me and the book are not welcome because of these media appearances. I see. And why, why do they not want you to appear on GB News, do you think? But I think because they think, I don't know, I mean, I think they think it's right wing. Um, but, you know, I never change my debate or my argument, no matter where I go. And ironically, I think if I went on the BBC, which is state owned, <laughs> I think that would be OK. So, you know, I really think we're, we're through the looking glass here. I think <laughs> we are. I mean, you must be quite devastated by this, uh, this uh, rebuff. Uh, no, no, I'm not devastated. I kind of saw it coming. But um, I'm disappointed that mm. any sort of book fair would turn a book down. Mm. I mean, that shows you, you know, that, that again is another level of censorship, isn't uh, it? You know, yeah. no platforming, uh, not, you know, you're not being welcome, removing invitations. Again, it's another form of censorship. And that is happening everywhere. Any, every university at the moment are sort of removing invitations to various speakers. So we really are in a sort of a time of censorship, McCarthyism even. Yeah, indeed. So, uh, I mean, do you have any regrets about appearing on GB News? Would you do it again <laughs> if, you had, if you had your life start all over again? Would you, would you accept that invitation? Yes, well, you know what? Um, I've, like I've always said, I'd rather be hung for a sheep than a lamb. So. Definitely. I mean, what I'm confused about, Lisa, is that you're an academic. I, I, I suppose, you, you know, we could describe you as centre-left and you're on this channel and... You know, I'm, I mean, always... I am an anarchist. I'm an anarchist. I'm not even you're, centre left. You're, you're an anarchist. <laughs> there you go. So you know, you've you've been uh, you've been uh, spurned by your own, if yes. you like. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and I mean, the, the whole point of GB News, I think, is that we're here to sort of just broaden and widen the national conversation. Mm. So do I mean, and I think GB News actually does it really well. Um, you know, I've been I'm a sociologist. So I'm interested in you know what society does and what it watches. Mm. So I've been following the Facebook page on GB News for. A about the last six months. And there seems to be, where I come from, which is Nottinghamshire, the mining communities, um, there's, there's a big following of GB News in those red wall seats. So I think it's, I don't know, I think I should be here, coming from Nottinghamshire, talking about, you know, things that people are interested in, giving people, you know, uh, talking openly. Um, the debates on GB News is always sort of far broader and more interesting than any, actually uh, the, any, of the, any of the other channels. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Um, what would you say, what's your message? You've got this platform now to the anarchist book fair. What would you like to say to them? <laughs> <laughs> what would I say to them? It's like, what would I say is... 
I don't think there's anything to say. You know, it, we, I was watching the programme before this one and, it, and it's that there's no room for debate because everything is censored. So if you just don't agree with someone on a minor point, you know, it's sort of blown up to, you know, you, you're a fascist or you're a turf or whatever it is at the, this particular moment. There seems to be no room for disagreement or debate. So what I would say to them is, you know, the identity politics that they're buying into at the moment will mean very little as people can't afford to put the heating on and can't afford food. So their identity politics will mean very little. I've said it before, Neil Fox, uh, I fear we're living in the age of intolerance. Well, just hearing Lisa's story, and we were discussing it before we came on today, I, I, it actually beggars belief. You can't quite believe that an organisation, our book fair that she was going to talk at, would stop her from doing it with her views, which are very similar to a lot of their views, just because she's come on a programme like this, where actually, I have to say, uh, we might all come from different political backgrounds or have thoughts, but we're allowed to chat about them. And surely that's the only way that we'll ever have problems solved, you know, whether it's at governmental level or a local level, just getting people to sit around a table and talk and discuss and air their views uh, sensibly, OK, mm -hmm. just uh, uh, in intellectually, smartly, and then hopefully come up with some kind of consensus. Because most problems, as we all know, none of them are black and white, really. They're yeah. all grey, or the solution will always be grey. Mm -hmm. So when you hear about this kind of censorship, or censorship of Jerry Sadowitz or, you know, other comedians, or obviously authors, you know, J.K. Rowling's death threat today, it's just yeah. crazy. This is... You, you can only imagine, you know, what would have happened, and social media is clearly is, is not the friends to free speech in many respects, it thinks it is, but can you imagine if in 1989 there had been social media when Salman Rushdie had first brought out satanic mm -hmm. verses, what the backlash would have been on social media? And I do think we have to be so very careful now. We have to be able to say what we think. I mean, one of my favourite comedians is Ricky Gervais. Now, mm -hmm. oh, my God, his Netflix specials are l unbelievable. I, even as a fan, I sometimes... I'm sort of watching them from behind my hands going, no, how... C but they're funny. It's really funny. And he says at the beginning, look, if this offends you, I'm sorry, this is what I do, you know know what I do, so turn off or go away. And I think, look, this is a, a gig people are going to in Edinburgh to watch Jerry Sadowitz. You know what he is, so if you want to go watch him, you should be able to go and watch him. If not, just don't go and see him. It's really simple, but other people saying you can't exercise your free will and go and watch that guy, it just... It, we're in a very dangerous area now. We are really in a very dangerous territory, and it has to stop. Well, that's right. I mean, if you want to stand by the courage of your convictions, Amy Day, then your opinions could withstand a little debate. Absolutely. I'm agreeing with you both uh, on the panel. We are, we are living in a very sensitive time and social media is more rife than ever. The backlash that you have will then affect your business, your company. Um, it is where people go to... to find things out and, and people use that social media platform to do death threats, to, to basically be keyboard warriors. Um, and I feel that people are speaking out about things these days that they wouldn't have been able to speak about before. And I feel like if you're seen to have an old fashioned opinion or view, then you're going to get the backlash. And so comedians being axed, it only makes sense because the company and the business that have axed them mm. have done it to save their own backs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really, really fair mm -hmm. point. Well, what's your view, Mark, at gbnews.uk? Uh, later in the show, in our news agenda with the panel, should all shops be forced to take cash? Is renting appliances a good way to tackle the cost of living crisis? And should workplaces make more time for fun? Uh, but later this hour, could it be true that Michelle Obama is planning a run for the White House in 2024? A top US author says so in an explosive new book. It's been a political earthquake and he joins us at 9.45. Uh, but next up in The Big Question, is Liz Truss the right choice for Britain? We'll hear from Tory insider Tim Montgomery and former Chief Secretary to the Treasury under John Major, uh, the one and only Jonathan Aitken. And straight after this, an announcement about a brand new show coming to GB News. See you in two. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. 
you've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrow. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. A big reaction to my big opinion monologue. We've seen comedy censors at the Edinburgh Festival and an attack on a great author in New York City. I think that, although, of course, uh, hardly comparable in terms of the appalling crime of attacking Salman Rushdie, I do think that this intolerance to other views is on the same spectrum. It's part of wokeism, it's dangerous, it's ideology, it's got to be tackled. Well, that, that's a view shared by Sonia who said, uh, Mark, that was absolutely brilliant. See how much shorter my emails are when I haven't had wine like last night. Um, thank you, Sonia, for that. Well, look, God bless you. You know, this show does get better and more entertaining the more you drink. But do drink in moderation. Um, Mark says, Mark, I live in Edinburgh and have attended many fringe shows, including your own. Oh, blimey. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. The cancellation of Sadowitz is a disgrace and comedians need to take a stand against this. Billy Connolly, the most famous of Scottish comedians, would have been cancelled. Uh, that is the sad state of affairs. I shall now boycott shows at the Pleasance and refuse to add to their immense bar profits. Um, George says, about the comedian that was banned at the Fringe, it's a pity all the other acts don't get together and cancel their appearances. Uh, and last but not least, Jean says, Mark, it will get to the point where we will be afraid to communicate with anyone. It has to stop but I don't know how. Uh, Jean, I so hear you. Um, use GB News, use social media, tell your friends and family and just spread the word that we've got to bring back free speech and protect British values. Do you know what will help? A brand new show starting on Saturday the 3rd of September from 8 till 9. And it's a new show called Dial Dolan in which I'll be taking your video calls for an hour live on the national television airwaves. So if you'd like to appear on that show and become a brand new GB News star, then drop me a line right now, mark at gbnews.uk. For an hour, every Saturday from 8 till 9 p.m., we'll be tackling the big stories of the day. And this is a people's channel, and so that show is all about you. Uh, so many signed up already last night. I've got emails from Tom, Andrew, Dave, Jill, Michaela, Zachary, Edward, Alan, Paul, Peter, Britt, Sue, Francis, and many more. So add your name to that list if you'd like to be an occasional caller to Dial Dolan. We'll see your gorgeous face on screen, and we'll hear your opinions, which is what this is all about. Mark at gbnews.uk. Dial Dolan, coming to your television sets on the 3rd of September at 8 p.m. It's time now for this. Dial Dolan, you want to be part of it. It's time now for the big question in which we tackle a major news story of the day. Tonight, following my big opinion monologue on last Sunday's show, calling for Rishi Sunak, who I had supported, to concede the Tory leadership race, Liz Truss has gained further momentum. 
with previous Sunak supporters joining her camp. And today, the Sunday Express coming out with a ringing endorsement for the Foreign Secretary. Well, barring a disaster, the keys to number 10 will be hers. She's got one hand on the trophy, but with some still set to cast their votes, it begs the question, is Liz Truss the right choice for Britain? The answer to that question could define the fate of this country for years, if not decades to come. So to debate this, I'm delighted to welcome former Chief Secretary to the Treasury under John Major, Jonathan Aitken, the founder of Conservative Home and former advisor to Boris Johnson, Tim Montgomery, and current serving Conservative MP for Dudley North, Marco Longhi MP. Uh, Mr Longhi, let me start with you. Welcome to GB News. Uh, which of the candidates enjoys your support? Oh, Liz Truss, absolutely. And why is that? Uh, because she is the one, as far as I'm concerned, who can be trusted to deliver on a plan for growth for the United Kingdom as a whole. Mm. Uh, this is what the country needs right now. We need to deal with uh, inflation, which is a scourge on this country economically. We know that. But we also know that the Bank of England has been predicting uh, a recession. And the way to tackle recession is not to tax ourselves out of recession. We all know that that is not possible, but to actually understand what we need to do in terms of generating the uh, economic activity, which it will be through growing the economy. That is how we get ourselves out of recession. So uh, that will create more jobs. And as foreign secretary, she has uh, in the last few years done what she promised to do. She has delivered on so many uh, trade agreements uh, globally. So she has my complete support in wanting to uh, put the country back on the straight and narrow economically. Although, uh, Mr Longhi, uh, can the country afford a financial and economic experiment, the idea of borrowing money to give people tax cuts, which, of course, her opponent, Rishi Sunak, has suggested will be inflationary? Well, what... Uh, the, what Mr Sunak, of course, isn't doing is saying how he is going to be dealing with inflation himself. It's by growing the economy and addressing the issues that are actually causing inflation right now, which are constrained capacity uh, rather than excess demand. Uh, so it's by addressing the issues, particularly as far as energy is concerned, and, and, and making sure that we uh, maximise supply of energy from uh, North Sea, for example, by aggressively going into nuclear and by actually dampening down on the costs of energy by reducing uh, uh, the, for example, addressing the green energy levy, uh, that will be uh, helping with dampening down on inflation by at the same time providing the capacity energy-wise that we need. So it's However, not going to happen it, overnight. Yeah. We all know that, yeah. but it's something that the country absolutely needs to address. It's a gamble, though, isn't it? It's an economic experiment. Uh, it could spike inflation. And uh, we're talking here about Rishi Sunak, who's somebody that knows the Treasury inside out. He knows what he's talking about. So why are we in this position in the first place, then, if that's the case? Because he bankrolled uh, Boris Johnson's uh, spendthrift policies. Uh, well, uh, it is under his term as chancellor that we find ourselves in this position you know i'm and i think he's a is an excellent candidate to be prime minister but i just happen to disagree with his economic policies on this i think liz has exactly the right plan for growing the economy and at the end of the day the the country voted for uh, a conservative government that is to be bold and it is by being bold and moving forward uh, with what you might describe as more risky. Well, I actually think it's a bigger risk not to do what uh, Liz Truss is doing and actually doing what I think, unfortunately, the former Chancellor is advocating. Uh, I mean, can I ask you, uh, Mr Longhi, whether you voted for the three national lockdowns? Uh, I did, very, very reluctantly. Uh, I am a civil engineer, or my background is in engineering, so my attitude as a brand new MP, keep in mind, uh, there was no uh, rule book at all to say how you would deal with a pandemic. There's no rule book that tells you how to be an MP, let alone to deal with a, a global pandemic when it hits you. So I, I, I took a view, which was to say, well, we have some highly paid and highly experienced civil servants who are clinical practitioners, we should follow their advice. And, you know, uh, I could be proven wrong, uh, uh, as may be the case. I'm sure there are PhD students looking at uh, various 
uh, ways of how we should have perhaps done th things differently, but hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? So I, I, I took a view that I would support the government all the way through and, and actually voted accordingly, unlike Captain Hindsight, who actually did not do that. He said he would support the government, but actually voted against the majority of the times. Well, that's right. I only asked you because I think that answers your question as to why the economy is in such a parlous state. I don't think it's really necessarily the policies of Rishi Sunak. It was three national lockdowns. Uh, we had to borrow half a trillion pounds to pay healthy people to stay home. But I do take your point that you're backing trust, Mr. Longy, and it seems like she's got what the Americans call the big mo. So Tim Montgomery, barring a disaster, number 10 is hers. I think that's right, Mark, and I don't think it's going to be close either. I think we're going to see a landslide victory. I think the opinion polls from YouGov and Conservative Home, the site I used to edit, are about right, and she'll win 60 65% of the vote. I think she has to be careful with that mandate, though. She shouldn't assume just because she has the confidence of Tory members, she has the full confidence of her parliamentary party or indeed the nation at large. I think actually if the vote had just been amongst MPs, it might have been a very, very close contest. And so she's going to have to do a lot of work to ensure that she earns the trust of everyone in this country and not overinterpret what will be, an, I suspect, an emphatic victory amongst Tory members. She's run a great campaign, Tim Montgomery, and uh, unfortunately, Rishi Sunak, given that I supported him at the start, seems to have limped from one self-inflicted disaster to another. Um, so she's run a good campaign. Will she be a good prime minister, do you think? Well, you never know the strength of a tea bag, um, Mark, until the tea bag's in hot water. So it's hard to exactly know, you know, who, how good she'll be. But mm. the reason why I think, you know, prefer her over Rishi Sunak is I do think this country needs change. I think I agree with what you've just said about the contribution that lockdowns made, you know, to the mess that we're in. But we also have become a high tax, high regulation um, economy. Uh, during Rishi Sunak's time as Chancellor, unlike his hero, Nigel Lawson, there have been no big reforms, no simplification of the tax system, no addressing of the housing crisis. And so I don't know uh, how good or what uh, or, or bad Liz Truss mm. will be, but I prefer her because I get the sense from her that she's unhappy with that status quo. I think it's more like we'll, we'll get some risk taking more likely we'll get the kind of rebooting of the economy, that entrepreneurial emphasis, tackling some of the wrong questions, we, wrong turns we've taken on energy. Um, some of the, you know, she's vowed not to take Britain into lockdown again, for mm. example. I think she's the change candidate that we need. And also knowing her a little bit, I think she's more of a straight talker. Um, and I think Britain's ready for someone to tell to tell us it's not going to be easy over the next couple of years, but a bit like a physician's mandate, if we take the right medicine, you know, we'll get there. And um, that's why, with my fingers crossed, you know, I'm hoping she will be a, a good prime minister. But um, you never know with a prime minister, you know, until they're really in Downing Street with all the demands mm. of, you know, one of the toughest jobs in the world, you know, there are no guarantees. And what about her character, Tim Montgomery? Because I think uh, many were disappointed by Boris Johnson, all of those Boris backers who saw an enfeebled prime minister in high office, somebody that folded to the worst uh, excesses of the sage scientists. The Mail on Sunday in late January reported that it was Sunak, Lord Frost and Jacob Rees-Mogg who prevented Boris Johnson from cancelling Christmas last year. Again, he was about to give in to the panicky professors and the prophets of doom at SAGE. So my, my overview about Boris is that he buckled under pressure, and I think that was a character issue. Has Liz Truss got a pair of balls on her? Has she got a backbone? Has she got, you know, a thick political skin? Can she deliver change? I think I think often, you know, almost regardless of Liz Truss's qualities, and I just say mm. why I think she has certain qualities that I admire, often what happens with prime ministers and presidents is that they know what the weaknesses of what's gone before um, are, 
And they kind of, you know, we look for the person who addresses those weaknesses. And I think also in, a, in the way that they then start thinking of themselves, they sort of compensate for their predecessors, as, you know, weaknesses. So actually, I think Liz Truss will be very aware of the, you know, the kind of criticisms it's just made and the kind of drift, therefore, we've had in Britain recently. And so I think she is going to take some tough decisions because I think there's a big awareness. I don't know what you think, Mark, but when I talk with friends, when I talk with family, People are worried. They think there's something not just a little bit wrong with the country at the moment, but something deeply wrong. And I think they know, therefore, that just a little tweak here and there isn't going to be enough. They want something substantial. And so I think because of that, you know, more important than her character and her qualities is that mood. If she understands that, and forms a cabinet of quality. That's the other big weakness of Boris Johnson. He surrounded himself with lightweights, frankly. He didn't have the best talents. And she needs to do that. And I'm a bit worried that she won't. I think she's likely she might put too many chums in top positions. Mm. And she also needs a apparatus around her that starts really road testing qualities before, road testing policies, excuse mm. me, before they are, you know, imposed on us. There's too much government by press release where they come up with an idea that they think is good and they announce it without going through, you know, the kicking the tires, et cetera. And um, I think she needs an apparatus, a, a system, an inner cabinet of people with grey hairs. And I've got a lot of grey hairs now, so perhaps I would say that. But there are too many young people who haven't been around the block enough, too many young people who don't really understand life. She needs some people around her You've, you know, people like Jonathan Aitken, frankly, you know, people who've served at the highest level of government, who know how things work, how to motivate the civil service. Mm. That's what I'll be looking for. The pick of her team is almost the, the most important thing she should be focusing on in the time she has left before becoming prime minister in early September. Well, I think it's interesting that you mentioned the makeup of her team, because speaking at uh, Hustings uh, here on GB News last week, hosted by Alistair Stewart, she said she was going to shrink down the number 10 operation, that number 10's got too powerful, too bloated, um, and, and that she's going to actually restore cabinet government in the golden era of the 1980s under Margaret Thatcher. And, uh, of course, latterly, John Major, which Jonathan Aitken knows all about. Jonathan Aitken, you served as Chief Secretary to the Treasury under John Major. And, of course, you were in Parliament when Mrs Thatcher uh, won that, uh, that election victory in 1979. Uh, so welcome to GB News, Mr Aitken. Uh, is Liz Truss Margaret Thatcher Mark II? I don't think there'll ever be a Margaret Thatcher Mark II. Um, I'm very non-political these days. I'm a prison chaplain and long gone from the political scene. But of course, I watch it with interest. And slightly to my surprise, I find I've actually got a vote because I've never cancelled my subscription to the Conservative Party. So in the coming days, I think some ballot papers will arrive. And I'm still just about a floating voter. I agree with a great deal of what Tim Montgomery said. But I, if I had to cast my ballot tomorrow, and I think I'd just about cast it for Rishi Sunak, really because of uh, two things. Uh, number one, he uh, is um, a man of great experience on what is the vital battlefield of all, which is the economy. Uh, and I think he's making a lot more economic sense than Liz Truss is. Um, Liz Truss, or both candidates, like to sort of say they're taking over the mantle of Margaret Thatcher. But it's forgotten that <clears throat> Margaret Thatcher was very cautious in her early days as Prime Minister. Her first major budget, um, the 1981 budget, she thought the priority was getting inflation down. She actually increased taxes. So I, I'm not a fan of some of the economic policies I hear. But let's face it, these are two very good candidates. Uh, they've both performed well. Uh, they have both got a lot of charisma. I think either of them could do the job. Um, I think Tim Montgomery struck an important note, which is um, the quality of the cabinet. Machiavelli's great um, essay on the prince begins with the words, most famous bullet of essay in history, the best way of judging the quality of a ruler is to look at the quality of the brains of the men and now women about him. Uh, and uh, we've had some weak, weak cabinets recently, 
Mm. And there are better people than in the front line of cabinet politics today around. And when I first came into Parliament in 74, um, there were giants uh, on the back benches on both sides, uh, men who'd got great experience, um, who'd been there for years, who'd done big things in their lives and their careers. Uh, I think we had a lot of people who'd fought very gallantly in the war. And I was no use harking back. But nevertheless, the key thing, wisdom, experience, real quality of being able to stand up and voice a clear, independent view around a cabinet table. Uh, this is what I think I'd be looking for in the next prime minister. And these hustings, I'm, I think I'm not the only one, even though I'm out of politics, I'm pretty bored by them. Uh, and I don't really agree with the system which gives boring old buffers like me uh, approaching 80 uh, a vote in this election just because um, we are members of the dwindling Conservative Party. Uh, this is no way to select a prime minister. Uh, I'd much rather have left it to the votes of those in the House of Commons. But we are where we are. I think Tim is probably right that um, Liz Truss has got the edge in these polls and so on. But nevertheless, uh, let's remember that the job of prime minister is the first lord of the treasury. And I think uh, decisive and clever uh, treasury decisions and treasury policies are really what are going to be needed to see Britain through. So, so briefly, uh, Mr. Aitken, would you, would you suggest that actually at the moment your vote goes with Sunak? Yes. Um, marginally. I mean, I'm, I'm still listening. We've still got mm. another two and a half weeks to go on, on this marathon, and you hear something new every day. Um, I'm not a knocker of this trust at all, although in the field I'm interested in as a prison chaplain, uh, she was not a good justice secretary. Uh, she was unhappy justice secretary, didn't win good opinions from people in the justice world. Uh, so um, on balance, I'm, even though I don't know him, uh, from what I hear, I, I would vote for Sunak on the grounds of experience. Um, Mr Aitken, uh, you've got quite the life story to tell. You're an icon of politics and now you're a man of faith as well. Uh, you've been through a lot, lots of highs and lows, but you're the ultimate survivor. I do hope you'll join us for my flagship interview slot, Mark Meets, in the coming months. I'd be delighted to do that. We look forward to that. Everywhere. Well, no, well, look, it's, uh, it's a conversation many of my viewers would love to hear and see. Um, look, let me give the last word to a serving Conservative MP, somebody with skin in the game, of course, Conservative MP for Dudley North, Marco Longhi. Um, thank you for making the time on a Sunday night, uh, Mr Longhi. Um, your closing thoughts on this. Uh, why should the membership back Liz Truss, in your opinion? Why should they? Mm. Um, well... How do we get this across the line for trust? Well, look, Liz has already set out what she's going to be doing to grow the economy. She's going to be scrapping national insurance tax rises. And we've all agreed, and these members have agreed, that actually approach the, the economic approach, which is to grow the economy, is the right one for the country rather than keeping high levels of tax. So she's going to scrap the national insurance tax. She's going to cut back corporation tax back to 19%. She's going to be introducing the moratorium on the green energy levy. She's going to be increasing defence spending. She's going to be dealing with the strike action problems that we've uh, been experiencing more recently. She's going to be expanding the Rwanda policy, which I know not everybody likes to talk about, but in this red wall seat that I represent is the one thing that I know my voters and my members want her to do, absolutely, something that we haven't really uh, delivered properly as a... Uh, as a Conservative government yet. And she's saying all the right things, as far as I'm concerned, as a member, but also as a serving member of Parliament. What I haven't heard, and of course, hearing from the likes of Jonathan, as he's just said, and I have huge esteem for him, he says, well, I'll go with Rishi because he's got more experience. But actually, Liz has got a huge amount of experience globally that I don't believe uh, uh, Rishi has in the same amount. And, and he will say that he's got this need to want to deal with inflation, which, of course, Liz does as well. But what Rishi doesn't say is how he will deal with uh, inflation. And we are in very strange times at the moment, and I completely agree with what Tim said. The country is ready for change, and it's ready for uh, not more of the same it's ready for something different. And I do believe that Liz is the candidate and the membership want this from Liz. 
Uh, change is the way to go. I think we can all agree on that. Uh, Mr. Longy, thank you so much for joining us. Delight to have you on the programme. Marco Longy is the Conservative MP for Dudley North. Also, a delight to be joined by Tim Montgomery, who is a founder, the founder of Conservative Home and a former advisor to Boris Johnson and former Chief Secretary to the Treasury under John Major, Jonathan Aitken. What's your view, Mark, at gbnews.uk? Next up, is Michelle Obama planning a run for the White House? And in my take at 10, why do we ignore old people? Why don't we prioritise them? I think we should be rolling out the red carpet for our golden generation. See you in two. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. But over a drink, we have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. A big response to our uh, uh, rather big uh, discussion there. The big question was all about, uh, is Liz Trust the right choice for Britain? Bob says, Mark, in relation to Boris buckling under pressure, bear in mind uh, he will have memory of how he felt in intensive care with COVID, which is a brilliant point. Um, how about Sean, who says, uh, the fact that a Christian priest, a Christian priest, would choose a Hindu over a Christian, says everything about the UK in 2022. Can you imagine the opposite in India? Uh, that's from Sean. I'll get to more of your opinions shortly. One person says, it's just a puppet show. Now that's David, who's not having either candidate. Um, look, I'll get to more of your thoughts shortly, but here's a story for you. While speculation rages about whether Donald Trump will run for the White House in 2024, who might face him? It's unlikely to be Joe Biden, who will be lucky to hang on in the Oval Office for the duration of his first term. So who's next? Well, a stunning new biography of the former First Lady Michelle Obama, wife of Barack, of course, suggests that she may be planning a run in two years' time. Joel Gilbert is the author of Michelle Obama 2024, her real life story and plan for power. And he joins me now. Hi, Joel. Hi, great to be here. Thank you. Uh, great to have you on the program. Congratulations on the publication of uh, this book, which has caused quite a storm in Washington. Uh, first of all, uh, just, just uh, what is the sort of likelihood that she might run for the big job, do you think? Well, I'm convinced that she's running for president. Uh, by the way, it's also a film on SalemNow.com as well as the book version on Amazon.com. Oh, great. But, uh, I've been following the Obamas for years, and I noticed that Michelle was uh, mimicking the exact same formula that Barack did to become president. Uh, Barack was the keynote speaker at the Democrat convention in 2004 for John Kerry. He introduced the candidate. Michelle introduced Joe Biden at the 2020 Democrat convention. Uh, Barack based his candidacy on his personal story, his book, best-selling autobiography, Dreams from My Father. 
In 2018, Michelle wrote her own autobiography called Becoming, which is also a movie on Netflix. And, um, you know, finally, uh, Barack started in politics with a voter registration organization in Chicago called Project Vote. And Michelle started a voter registration organization called When We All Vote. And she's running around the country giving these fiery political speeches. So I'm 100 percent convinced she has a um, hundred million followers on social media. She's all politics all the time. She's the best loved Democrat, the most popular person in the country. So I'm absolutely convinced that she is planning a run for president. Um, would the family want to put themselves through another four years of 24 seven security? Uh, no privacy, of course, global public scrutiny and long hours. Yeah, the Obamas are all politics all the time. Uh, Michelle mm -hmm. is right now, if you look at her Twitter account, it's all about politics. She's a very political person. You might remember back in 2008, she was so political, she went over the top and said, for the first time in my life, I'm proud of my country because Barack won a, a primary. And that's when they pulled her back. They told her she was hurting the campaign. She couldn't be like Hillary because people ended up hating Hillary. So they told Michelle, look, you hate politics and you just want to be the mom in chief. So she agreed to kind of take a step back. And that's how in the White House, she became the most popular woman on the planet. All the magazine covers and TV shows, they just love politics, the Obamas, and they're itching, uh, I think, to get back in the White House. Uh, let's bring my panel in, if I can, Joel, uh, Amy Day, Neil Fox and Lisa McKenzie, all political commentators and broadcasters. And uh, while we set that up, let me just ask you, Joel, about... Michelle Obama's character. Tell me about her personality. What kind of person is she? She really doesn't have any original thoughts. She just kind of repeats whatever's going on. She repeats the Democrat talking points quite well, actually. She's really a better politician than Barack ever was. She comes off more authentic. She's a better speaker. But like Barack, she's going to base her candidacy on a life story that is more fiction than fact. In my book and film, Michelle Obama 2024, I chronicle that her entire life story that she's been pushing and promoting has just been to manipulate minority and black voters with these phony stories of racial discrimination. In fact, Michelle had a very privileged childhood. Uh, she always worked for Democrat Party elites to deal with black people that were, were getting out of line. So Michelle actually has a, a work history in Chicago of exploiting and selling out black people, working for the mayor of Chicago, working for the University of Chicago hospitals. And as a child, she ran away from the black community in Chicago. She always went to study with elites in elite schools. Yet she tries to tell these stories to pretend that she's one of these ordinary black folks that she really spent her life selling out. You have to salivate, don't you, at the prospect of Obama this time, Michelle versus Trump, Donald. Uh, no, I'm not salivating over that. I mean, what a, what a spectacle that would be, though. No, but don't you think that politics now has become uh, just another... It's a circus. The family Bush, the family Trump, the family Obama, the family uh, Clinton. It's, you know, this, this is not politics. This is dynasty. Mm. You know, the, this... I want politicians to represent the people, not their own families, not their own family businesses. Well, I agree. I mean, I think you're right. It's, it's politics, it's, it's a dynasty, and it's show business. That's It's show biz, yeah. It's, it's, it's show biz. It's, you know, it's like, oh, I'll go and see that movie because I recognise the name of the actor this, in it. It's Tom Cruise. Uh, speaking of Tom Cruise, let's talk to the <laughs> handsome devil that is Neil Fox. <laughs> uh, Neil, you just, you've just read um, Michelle Obama's autobiography. I have. I, mean, I finished Becoming a couple of weeks ago, actually, and I'd have to disagree with Joel. I mean, I, I, from her book, she did come from a pretty humble working background. She just worked her butt off and had parents that really encouraged her to work really hard. So she went to a local normal school, did really well, ended up going to Harvard... Uh, and getting herself an amazing law degree. And she did seem to, you know, I think she, according to her book, come from a pretty normal background. She just worked very hard to get where she was. And then she wanted to make sure she could try and give a voice to other people who may be not so fortunate to her. I, the only thing I would say is you obviously, from 
you've decided that you think, and it obviously makes a great story, that she will run again. I mean, in the last page of that book, she categorically denies that she will ever run again. Of course, people can change their minds. But she says in it, she says, people have asked me whether I would run. I would never run. I think, you know, they've done eight years. That's more than enough. I guess they do already have 24-hour security. That will never change mm. for an ex-president. So that wouldn't change. But uh, I have to say, I would doubt, having certainly read her book, that she would go back into it because she's probably worked out you could be more useful not being in the White House. You only have to see the problems America has with how the uh, how the two parties won't vote for the other one in any way, so nothing actually ever seems to get through, which is a real problem. So for President Obama's uh, presidency, she could probably have much more power not being in the White House. OK, uh, Joel, the clock's against us. Your closing thoughts on this. I can't wait, by the way, to read the book, and I'll certainly have a look at it on Salem now, uh, the movie as well. Yeah. But your final thoughts on this. There, there's the book <laughs> or, and, and also the, uh, the movie. So, uh, so, um... Look, why, why 2024? Why not 2028? Yeah, she's just been preparing to run since 2016. Uh, the other commentator pretty much bought into the official story in Becoming. Michelle's autobiography is a political document. It's not an autobiography. She's just fixing certain things to set up her candidacy. Uh, she went to exclusive schools. She blatantly lies about it. She says that she went to neighborhood schools. She says her parents couldn't afford private schools. Yet Michelle went to a magnet school an hour and a half from where she lived. Her brother went to a private Catholic school for $3,500 a year, even though the Robinsons weren't Catholic. So Michelle has been putting up this story that she hates politics for years, but she is a political animal. Her father was a precinct captain working for the Democrat Party machine in Chicago. She grew up in Jesse Jackson's house because she was best friends with his daughter, Santita. So Michelle very much is preparing to run for president. And I think you'll see next year in the spring, she's going to say something like, you know, I hate politics, but I love this nation and I'm going to form a committee to help me decide what to do. There's no question about it. Uh, well, Joel, an absolute thrill to have you on the show. Joel Gilbert, the author of a stunning new book all about Michelle Obama and her run for the presidency in 2024. Thanks, Joel. Catch up soon. Uh, you are watching Mark Dolan tonight and a massive hour to come. Don't go anywhere. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, man. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrow. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. It's just gone 10 o'clock and this is Mark Dolan tonight. My Mark meets guest is boxing legend Chris Eubank Jr. We'll talk about his next big fight. 
fame, money and that rather well-known father of his. In the news agenda with my panel, should all shops be forced to take cash? Is renting appliances a good way to tackle the cost of living crisis? And should workplaces make more time for fun? Plus, tomorrow's papers at exactly 10.30. And after this, my take at 10. Our society does not appreciate older people. In my view, we should be rolling out the red carpet for the golden generation. A busy hour to come. But first, the headlines with Bethany Elsie. Mark, thank you. Good evening. Here are your top stories from the GB newsroom. Sir Salman Rushdie's son, Zafar, has said his father has suffered life-changing injuries in a knife attack on Friday. But that his feisty and defiant sense of humour remains intact. The 75-year-old author of the Satanic Verses has been taken off a ventilator after being stabbed at a literary event in New York State. The man accused of attacking him, 24-year-old Hadi Matar, has pleaded not guilty to attempted murder and assault. A group of 70 charities are calling on the next Prime Minister to do more to, to offer more support to help people with soaring energy bills. In an open letter, signatories including Save the Children and Age UK are warning that vulnerable people are facing a catastrophe in the winter. The government has already committed to giving the poorest households £1,200. Meanwhile, Labour is expected to call for the energy price cap to be frozen at just under £2,000 this autumn. Rishi Sunak says he plans to make Britain energy secure, including boosting North Sea gas production. The former Chancellor says he'd legislate to make the UK's energy independent by 2045 to prevent a repeat of the looming winter crisis. Businessman... Business and Energy Minister Greg Hans told GB News a long-term plan is essential. But that's also why Rishi Sunak has laid out a comprehensive plan for energy security going forward, making sure we're energy independent uh, within a generation. You know, that takes a long time to make changes on energy. It takes a long time to commission nuclear power plants. It already takes 10 years or more to build an offshore wind farm. So you need to have a long-term plan as well. Rishi Sunak has got that in place. More than 20,000 migrants have crossed the English Channel in small boats so far this year. Government figures show 607 crossings were made just yesterday. In 2021, a total of just more than 28,000 people were recorded making that journey. And the UK is braced for three days of yellow weather warnings for thunderstorms following the heatwave this week. The Met Office says there's a high risk of power cuts and flash flooding after days of dry and hot weather. Firefighters continue to tackle wildfires in Hull, Kent and Dorset today. Residents near Dartford Heath are being warned to avoid the area after a fifth wildfire there this year. And Dorset Fire Service are calling for an end to disposable barbecues following a huge blaze across Studland Nature Reserve. You're watching GB News on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. Now let's get back to Mark. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight, a very busy hour to come. The papers at 10.30 with full panel reaction and Chris Eubank Jr. live on the programme straight after this. Age is just a number. I've started, so I'll finish. Age is just a number, or so you thought, except the shocking new research published in today's Mail on Sunday suggests that people over 50 are the victims of ageism when it comes to their access to financial services. Any entrepreneur worth their salt will tell you you can't grow a business or invest in an idea or product without a bit of capital. But if you've made the mistake of being born before 1970, you'll find the computer says no. We've got a horribly ageist society in which older people struggle to get new jobs are often cruelly overlooked by the welfare state or shafted in their pensions because the government thinks they're rich, which they're not. And many don't feel safe walking the streets at night because contempt for older people is at an all-time high. And even the media, the ultimate barometer of public attitudes, seems to largely erase people once they turn 50. Look at BBC Radio who have seen the systematic ethnic cleansing of some of their best DJs due to the date on their birth certificate. Chris Moyles, Simon Mayo, Steve Wright 
and the hugely talented Liz Kershaw, who recently said, I got sacked from BBC Six Music for being over 60. Well, I'm delighted to say that she's now a regular here. Arlene Phillips was too old for Strictly. Apparently, John Humphreys was too old for Mastermind. I've sat in that black chair. He's as alert as they come. And the extraordinary broadcasting genius that is Eamon Holmes was apparently too old for ITV. Well, the growing army of Brits watching Isabel and Eamon Monday to Thursday here on GB News at breakfast will tell you that Eamon has the energy of a 17-year-old. And new tricks actress Amanda Redman has slammed the archaic underrepresentation of women over 50 on TV. She's 65 but looks about 40 and said it makes her blood boil when she sees opportunities for women on screen start to decrease when they pass 50. Speaking to the mirror, she said, as an actor, what you bring is your experience of life too. You've lived and all the experiences that you've had in life inform the characters that you play. Whether it's on TV, on the radio, in social media, or just out there in regular daily life, old people are at best overlooked and at worst ignored. But we're talking about a section of the population with, as Redmond points out, more life experience than anyone else. And I'd argue more wisdom. They've experienced the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune and most have the moral framework, the humility and the compassion that life's ups and downs give you. Older people have been there and got the T-shirt. People aged 50 and beyond, into their 60s, 70s and 80s, they understand that life is short. They understand that there's good and bad in the world, but mostly good wins. They know that you should be kind to your neighbours, family and friends, and that you shouldn't spend money you haven't got. They understand that you should fix the problems that you can actually do something about and accept the problems that you can't. In other societies, it's older people who are revered. Here, it's the opposite. Which is why I credit McDonald's, not just for the excellent filet o fish hamburger, I normally ask for two patties, lovely flavour. But McDonald's this week have announced their decision to recruit older people to fill staff vacancies, including those over 60 and into their 70s. Put bluntly, when was the last time that you went to a shop like Costa or pret manger and were served your latte by an old lady called Edna or Ethel? When was the last time someone called Bill or Gerald pulled you a pint of old speckled hen at your local boozer? What happened to old people? What have we done with them? Where did they go? It's time we rolled out the carpet for senior citizens and gave them the chance of a late career, an income and a fulfilling life. Older people, are even getting it done in the bedroom. Check this out. The Telegraph have reported that the over 50s are having the best sex of their lives. That's good news. Mrs Dolan's only got two years to go. Let's hope it's worth the wait. Older people are a colossal untapped resource in our society and businesses recruiting and investing in those over 50 will be good not just for them, but for our economy and our society as we get back on the path to recovery. Everyone's got a role to play, irrespective of age. Hooray for the oldies. They might just be our future. It's time now for Mark Meets, in which I speak to the biggest names in the world of politics, sport, showbiz and beyond. Tonight, boxing megastar Chris Eubank Jr., who's just announced one of the year's most eagerly awaited fights. It reignites one of the sport's most iconic family rivalries as he takes on Connor Ben, the son of Nigel, who Chris's dad famously fought in two epic world title bouts 30 years ago. Wow. Was it 30 years? October's fight at the O2 Arena in London sold out in 45 minutes, marking it out as the must-see sporting event of the year. I'm delighted to say that one of the most successful and talented British sports stars in the world, Chris Eubank Jr., joins me now. Hey, Chris. Good evening. How are you doing, Mark? I'm really well. So excited about the fight. Uh, why is it special to you? Why is it special to me? I mean, it's uh, it's it's history in the making. This is uh, this is a fight that's never happened before in the, in the history of the sport. Two legends who captivated. Uh, you know, a nation's imagination fighting twice, you know, 30 years ago and 17 million viewers. 
um, becoming superstars and their sons grow up and, and, and get in the ring 30 years later, it's, uh, it's, it's just never happened before and it probably will never happen again. And that is, uh, it's very exciting. Well, yes. Uh, yes. Earlier in the show, we were talking about political dynasties and uh, Michelle Obama possibly running for the White House in 2024. This is a boxing dynasty, isn't it? It really is. Yes. Um, Eubank and Ben, those, those two names are synonymous with boxing and, and, and with British, you know, just, just British sports in general. And obviously in this fight, um, you know, my father having won the first fight and drawing the second in this fight, the people are calling it the trilogy. And this is the Ben's chance of, uh, of evening the score, which is something that I cannot let happen. What do you need to do to beat this guy? Um, I just need to show up, you know, I'm, I'm levels above this fire, in my opinion. Um, I got into his head. I'm, I'm, I'm living in his head rent free at the moment. After the <laughs> press conference, I can see that I really rattled him. Uh, so the, 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 the first, the first round is one. Now I just need to go into that ring and, and, uh, and finish him off. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. Um, how has your game changed under the stewardship of Roy Jones, Jr.? Roy Jones is a legend, um, and I have learned some some awesome things from him in in the short period of time that we've been together. We've only been training together for about two years, and I've I've learned so much. Um, he is uh, that isn't him, by the way. That is a different uh, trainer. But uh, but yes, Roy yeah. Jones is uh, is uh, is a legend, and I, I train with him very often, and I, I learn a lot, and, and can't wait to. Uh, there's Roy, can't wait to uh, start a new training camp with him. And 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 has he helped you? I mean, obviously, you know, skill set, technique, uh, nutrition, training. Uh, w what about the psychology? Has he helped you with that as well? That's the main thing he has helped me with. You know, I'm 32 years old, so there's only so much or so many new tricks you can teach an old dog. But um, the mental aspect of, of the sport is what's really opened my eyes. And, uh, you know, I, I thought I knew it all. I thought I'd been there, I'd done it. But, you know, each and every day I train with him, uh, I learn something new. So it's incredible. And I, uh, yeah, I, I appreciate all the time that I spend with him. Uh, you look incredible. No summer off for you. No trip to Ibiza for any late night clubbing or cold Thavetha on the beach. Um, is, it, is it proper boot camp territory that you're in now? Yes, the training camp has started. Um, you know, I, I will be training through my birthday, which happens to me quite a lot, actually. Most years I actually have, have a fight around my birthday, so I can't actually celebrate it, which is... Pretty annoying, but, you know, it's part of the job. You know, you learn to accept it. And, um, yeah, I have, to, I have to be at a new weight for this fight, a, a weight I've never fought at, 157 pounds. Um, it's a catch weight. It's a weight that I've never been, or I've never fought at. I haven't even been that weight in, since I was about 18. So it, that is going to be a huge challenge in itself. I'm also restricted to how much weight I can put back on after the weigh-in, which is another thing I've never done before. So it's all new territory. Um, but, you know, I love a challenge. Has being lighter changed the way you fight? Well, it's, 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 change, it's going to change the way I prepare. Um, I hope it doesn't change how I fight. I hope I still have the energy to do what I usually do in the ring. Um, but obviously he's coming up in weight, so I have to come down to make it fair. Um, you know, time will tell how the, the weight cut, the extra weight cut will affect me. Yeah, and uh, let's talk about the influence of your dad. I mean, you're now the more famous Eubank. He is Chris Eubank Jr.'s father. Let's have that right. Um, is he, is he going to help you in the run-up to October? Will he be uh, in your corner? I hope so, uh, believe it or not. I haven't actually really spoken to him since the fight was announced. He's, uh, he's, uh, I, I'm not sure what his thoughts are on helping me prepare for the fight and being in my corner. I would love for him to be a part of it, but I actually, at this moment, I don't know, which is pretty crazy to, to say, but it's the truth. You know, he's, 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 he's been, a he's always been by my side throughout my career, but you know, over the last few years, he's taken a backward step and, uh, I don't know, maybe he's not ready to come back into the limelight, but we'll find out over the next few weeks and hopefully I can persuade him. 
Well, yeah, I mean, it'll be emotional for him because, of course, you know, Connor, the man that you're fighting, his father was Nigel, and, and it was the clash of the titans, really, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, this, it's, it's a crazy amount of history, and uh, I have a huge responsibility to uphold the, uh, the Eubank dynasty and the family name. Mm. Um, yeah, the pressure is on, and uh, I'm ready for it. Uh, you obviously grew up with your dad being this incredible, famous athlete. You entered the same sport. Uh, you've made your you've made your own way. Um, are there similarities between the two of you in the ring? Uh, I believe so. I've, I've definitely inherited my my old man's granite chin. Never been knocked out. Never been knocked down in my career as an amateur or as a pro. Um, you know there are similarities, but I do think I have a I have a very unique boxing style. Um, I think I'm more aggressive than what my father was. He was he was a chess he was a chess player. You know um, I'm I'm more of a a guns blazing type of fighter um, when I want to be when I want to be. But um, yeah, the similar simil similarities are there for sure, uh, inside and outside the ring. I know that losing is not in your vocabulary. I'm confident you will prevail in October. But how much is riding on it in terms of your career, your reputation, if it wasn't to go according to plan? Everything's riding on this fight. Uh, I, I, I said it in the, in the press conference. If, if, if I was to lose or if Conor Ben was to beat me, my career is finished. I can't. Uh, I, I would have to retire. And I've never said that before, fight. But this is the truth of the matter. If I, you know, my my goal is to fight for a world title within the next year at middleweight. Um, I can't do that if I lose to a fighter like Conor Ben. So um, that that is another very, uh, you know, a, a big added pressure for me because I know that if I lose this, that's it. I got to hang the gloves up. Um, if you do win, when you win, is that your last fight? When I win, absolutely not. Uh, there are many, many great fights out there for me to have, um, many world titles for me to capture. Uh, and, you know, I, I should be, um, I'll be looking to get right back out there probably in December. So, um, yeah, right. watch this space. Yeah. And, and, and what about that world title? That's got to be the dream, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm in mandatory positions to fight for a world title. Um, it's just pinning down the current world champions. There's a lot of politics in boxing, so it's not as easy sometimes as people think to just, uh, you know, get yourself into a position to fight for one. But within the next year, 100%, I will be a world champion. How are you getting to that low weight, right? Because I don't want to give away any trade secrets, but you're clearly very trim. You're, you're, you're going to be as light as you were when you were a teenager. Have you cut the carbs? What have you given up? I mean, we've still got some way to go, so there's still a lot of work I need to put in. I'm, I'm not anywhere near that way at the moment, and it's going to be tough to cut. But, you know, I have my techniques. I have my ways. I've, I've kind of perfected weight cut over the last 10 years. Um, I'm confident I will, I will get it done. And, if, and, and, and there are, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of pounds in fines if I don't make the weight. So that is another added incentive for me to make sure that those pounds come off. My uh, producer, Tom Pollard, is a huge fan of yours, a huge fan of boxing, and he's written a question that I don't understand, which is, uh, do you fancy the winner of the GGG Canelo? Absolutely. Triple G is, uh, currently holds a middleweight world title, and um, that is the, the fight we're going to be pushing for next. He's a big name in the sport. He has, uh, he has the belts, and uh, he's the man I want to share the ring with next. Uh, listen, it's such a treat to have you on the show. You look incredible. I'll be rooting for you in October. And uh, thank you for joining us on GB News. Good luck with that low-carb diet. Have fun and uh, the best of luck this autumn. Good man. Appreciate it, Mark. Brilliant. The remarkable, the very talented Chris Eubank Jr., a true British sporting icon, just like his old man. Love those interviews. Uh, I didn't understand that question at the end about GGG because uh, my knowledge of boxing is limited, although I do love it. I remember watching... Frank Bruno uh, fight Joe Bugner uh, in, that would have been, what, the late 80s, early 90s? And, uh, you know, all these icons, um, so many great British uh, boxers we've had over the years. And, um, and therefore, it's an amazing sport. We'll be watching that uh, fight in our millions, no doubt, in October. There you go. What do you think about that a second career for me as a, 
as a boxing commentator, once I get the hang of all those names, like GGG Canelo, or is it Triple G? Um, folks, uh, let's crack on. Um, we've got lots more to do. In a couple of minutes, we've got the papers with full panel reaction. Uh, but next, is renting appliances the best way to tackle the cost of living crisis? We'll discuss that. Plus, reaction to the uh, first uh, editions of the papers very, very shortly. Uh, also, do you know what we're going to talk about as well? Should shops be forced to take cash? I think it's a disgrace when they say no credit cards only. So we'll talk about that next as well. See you shortly. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Thank you. Well, uh, lots to get through, including the papers hot off the press in the next couple of minutes. In fact, like a sort of primary school teacher, I'm going to hand out uh, all these bits of paper Thanks, sir. to my lovely students. Although, frankly, I'm, I'm a student of theirs. They're also clever. Um, we'll get to my panel very shortly. Who are my panel? Shall we name check them? Let's do that. Model, actress and singer Amy Day. Legendary radio and TV presenter, Neil Dr. Fox. Good evening. So great to see Neil again. And a very good friend of mine, ethnographer and academic, Lisa McKenzie. Great to have all three of you with me. Uh, we've got the papers in just a couple of minutes, but I really want to get to this story first. Uh, cash seems to be making a comeback as a result of the cost of living crisis, but some shops still refuse to take it. The post office reported a 20% increase in the number of notes withdrawn compared to last year. Despite this, a survey found that 86% of London shops, for example, didn't take cash, whilst half of venues in Birmingham only accepted cashless payments. But as more of us turn to jam jar budgeting, should shops be forced to accept cash? Uh, I think, Lisa, this should be an absolute copper-bottomed rule because money, hard cash, is still our currency. No, I, I agree with that. I think, you know, uh, my research and, you know, my experience of life is that people earn, like to earn a little bit of cash on the side and, you know, and if, if there is no more cash, you know, how will people make ends meet? Um, I, I remember in the lockdown, actually, I, I should, probably shouldn't say, there was a, a well-known bakery mm. And a lady, a woman who worked in there allowed an elderly lady to pay cash when the bakery had said, we're not taking cash anymore, and lost her job. 
That's shocking. So, you know, I think we are moving... Again, I, I don't know what is happening to us. You know, cash is not accepted anymore. Um, you know, whenever I go and get my nails done or, you know, I'll get my car washed, yeah. those people, they, you know... those Lovely nails. Yeah. Gone for a kind of salmon pink, it suits you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, you know, they, they, they want cash. They take cash. So I think a cashless society is... You know, I don't think it's what we want. I don't think anyone well, it wants it. gives that. the state and bureaucrats and technocrats and unelected people more power over our lives, well, yeah. doesn't it? Yes, yeah, yeah. And also, you know, when you've got a limited amount to live on, yeah. you you know, having a card that you can tap, you know, it's you can't Fatal. really... Yeah, yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. And we've got to remember that, you know, in the next couple of years, people are going to get poorer. We, you know, we're not we're not going to get wealthier. We're going to get poorer, and there will be people that need those extra pennies. But if those pennies are dots on a bank, you know, on a screen, mm. how would I? You know, I think we've really got to start thinking about. And I think older people who I talked about in my mm. in my take at ten uh, are used to dealing with cash, maybe in their seventies or eighties, and they're not comfortable with a credit card. Maybe they're nervous about getting into debt. Yeah. Also, they may be worried that the card will be stolen yeah. or, or, or scammed in some way, whereas cash is, in some ways, safer. Yeah, well, cash is safer, and it's also, it's also easier for people to budget. Yeah. You know, that you know, you're not going to be tempted to buy that extra thing if you've got cash, because you've well, got it, the money. Well, it sort of physically hurts having yes. to hand over yeah. money, doesn't it? Yeah. It's, it's more emotional, yeah. um, it's more physical. And, and also, you mentioned about casual labour, and this is another thing, yeah. sort of the informal economy. The, yeah, the informal in economy. In which someone says, you know what, I'll wash your car for a tenner. Yeah, and, it, and it's sometimes it's that tenner yeah. that will get you through the week. It's that last tenner that perhaps you got for, the car, for cleaning a car or cutting someone's hair or whatever it is that gets you through the week. And we are moving into those times now. Well, Amy Day, don't you think that cash is just more human? I definitely do. Um, I feel like... I thought it was just a COVID thing so that we didn't touch and pass on. I know. So the fact that it's still here is really annoying. However, it is not a law that shops have to accept cash. So if, it, if they decide not to, yeah. it's absolutely their prerogative. Yeah. Mm. But it is annoying when you want to give that tenor that you were given from someone for doing mm. a little job and you can't spend it. Mm. However, if you really need to have cash in hand to budget, then I think you need to be able to budget a bit better than that. Well, yes, I guess people will learn. I mean, you're the younger generation, so you probably generally pay electronically, do you? I do, but... You know, there are still car parks that ask you for a pound an hour, yeah. which is very annoying. And also, you lose those discretionary things like being able to tip people. I mean, I know you can mm. leave something on the machine if you go to a restaurant, yeah. mm. but that's not the same as, as uh, putting a couple of quid uh, on the saucer yeah. when you leave. And also, if this is going to be the new era that there's no cash, when, when Grandma sends me a £20 note in my, in my birthday card, I'm going to be thinking, oh, great, I've got to take a trip down to the bank. Mm. Yeah, and I think, don't you think, Amy, that you've got a different relationship with money when you can see it and you can hold it and yeah. you can count it. Absolutely. Because, I mean, that's how I grew up with, you know, generous family members for my birthday, a tenner here, yeah. um, 20 Pocket quid there money. if I was lucky. And, and I would save that money and I'd look at it and I'd recount it. Yeah. Do you know who's really yeah. been hurt with this? Homeless people. Homeless people is another huge factor. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it's true. Yeah. Um, there are people on the streets... Uh, mm. who haven't, Neil, got one of those electronic devices that can take a payment. Yep. Well, they haven't. And, you know, it's there's an inevitability that we will move towards a cashless mm. society, of mm. course, because it's much easier to account. I mean, you know, any anyone who runs a small business for HMRC, you have to make tax digital now, which means you have to have Sage or QuickBook or something, yeah. so everything is electronic and it's done. So it makes, it makes the transaction easy. But, of course, it's also very big brother because, you know, you think during the pandemic, for the banks, the institutions, the governments, whoever needed to, they could know who you are, where you are, what you are, what you're spending on. I mean, literally, you literally... They knew everything about where we were going, what we were doing and what we are buying. And that, there's something slightly scary about that, of course, even though it's very easy. But you made a very good point. Mm. It's very easy to tap away without even... Mm. It doesn't feel like money, does it? You just go tap. You don't even know how much it was. But even something about when you just have to, you know, sign a credit card thing, at least you have to look at it. I know. But now you just go tap. Yeah. You, you almost don't even see the amount. And it's too easy to spend money, which the big institutions know, and I guess play mm -hmm. on that. Interest rates are going up all the time. So, it, and that's, you know, we, we are going to have some real problems in the next few years, clearly, as we move more into recession. And, of course, like all these things, it hits the poorest 
hardest. Mm. As reflected in tomorrow's papers, it's time for this. That's right, it's that time in the evening when we look at tomorrow's front pages, which are in hot off the press. And we'll start with the FT, and they're leading with the following. Uh, US lawmakers call for Donald Trump security threat assessment. P FBI uh, search deepens uh, partisan divide. Ex-president declined to return confidential papers. Cambridge startup to create new classes of molecule by rewriting the code of life. Uh, there you go. Those are the headlines in the Financial Times. Um, we'll get a, a fact sheet to explain that front page <laughs> later in the show. Uh, the Independent now. Let's have a look at what they've got. Uh, protests a year on from Taliban takeover. And food banks run out of stock as demand surges. Uh, food banks are running out of supplies because of a massive increase in the number of people falling into hardship with some charities forced to turn away families. Several managers told The Independent they'd run out of food this summer. Deeply troubling story, that one, which we'll reflect on shortly. Uh, Mextro next and uh, freeze. Starmer throws down gauntlet by promising to block a rise in energy bills. £29 billion plan aimed at trumping any offers from Tory leadership rivals. OK, we'll go to the I newspaper next. Sunak and Truss under pressure to cut price cap. Tory leadership contenders face growing calls to propose reforms to energy price cap as Treasury creates new blueprint to cut £400 from bills this winter. Uh, the Express. Uh, Sir Salman off ventilator and his usual feisty self. Uh, good news there uh, in relation to Sir Salman Rushdie, who was attacked in New York on Friday. Um, and leadership contender will take dynamic action to grow economy and help poorest. Radical Truss vows to reform crisis Britain. Liz Truss vows to sever Britain's growing dependence on crisis handouts with her radical plan to boost the economy. And storm warning, heat wave is over, now come the floods. And hopefully uh, the last conversation about climate change for a while. Next up, we've got The Guardian. Uh, this shows that if we don't defend free speech, we live in tyranny. Margaret Atwood on the attack on Salman Rushdie as he begins a long road to recovery. Good to hear a top author defending another author. That was very much the theme of my big opinion monologue, which Sammy in our digital team has now edited down into a video, which you can see on our GB News Twitter feed. Indonesians on UK farms face a risk of debt bondage. Indonesian labourers picking berries on a farm that supplies Marks & Spencer, Waitrose, Sainsbury and Tesco, say they've been saddled with debts of up to £5,000 by unlicensed foreign brokers to work in Britain for a single season. That sounds like an appalling scandal. And Starmer calls for £8 billion energy windfall tax. OK, now let's have a look at the star, always with a bit of light relief. Do not keep it clean, you filthy suds. The latest drought measures may include a ban on cleaning windows. Boffins also suggest we don't flush our wheeze. Yet, fat cat water firms paid out £3 billion to investors. Water blooming mess, say the star. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, the, uh, the Mirror newspaper. Uh, Strictly Helen, I can't dance and feel sick, but I love the dresses. Oh, story of my life. Uh, Starmer's energy demand freeze cruel bills now. Keir Starmer has told the Mirror the country faces a national emergency due to rising fuel bills. The Labour leader wants the energy price cap frozen to stop it rising to £3,600 in October. A truly horrific figure. And those are your front pages. Let's get full reaction from my panel. Uh, let's speak to our actress, broadcaster and uh, influencer, Amy Day. And Amy, across the board, uh, pressure on... Whoever is going to be our next Prime Minister, Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak, to do something about soaring energy bills. I don't know too many people who can afford £3,500 a year. Neither do I. Mm -hmm. Neither do I. They need to put a cap on it. I don't know what that will then affect. Um, I think that, you know, Liz Truss, if you asked me two weeks ago who I wanted to be Prime Minister, I would have said Liz. But I don't think I do any more today. Um, I feel like sh that she's kind of just focusing on the tax and she needs mm. to focus on everything else. 
Well, that's really interesting because that's very much the theme of Rishi Sunak's mm -hmm. campaign is that, that we can't afford tax cuts, yeah. but that he will distribute sort of focused support for families that are really struggling. Yeah, which I think is a very, very important um, situation that does need to I be I mean, could, could this issue of, of energy prices, cost of living, could it move the dial in the Tory leadership race, do you think, Amy? Or do you feel that, as I said earlier, Liz Truss has got one hand on the trophy? That's a really hard question. What does your gut tell you? I mean, do you think Rishi's out? If you were Rishi, would you throw the towel in now? No, not at all. I think, in my opinion, I think Rishi's actually going to get it. Really? Um, I feel like people have now realised that Liz isn't as warm of a character as mm. we would hope. Mm. And I think that people are now like, well, it's Rishi or Liz, so I mm. think we'll go for Rishi because we know him more. So is it a case that the, the more you've got to know Liz Trust, the less you like her? Sadly, yes. Mm. I agree with that. I was rooting that. for her. Yeah. Really? I was really rooting yeah. for her. What, what, what was it about her at the start that caught your eye? Um, I, th I think because she was a woman, I just mm. wanted, you know, there were, there were three women in the, in the run-up and I just thought, come on, let's do this. Yeah. And she's now the last one left and it's just, it's a bit disappointing. That's really... What, do, mm. do you feel that she's making promises she can't, can't actually fulfil? Is, um, is it... I feel like she's just focusing... Maybe she's just focusing in one section and not mm. actually thinking about the entire... So, so Neil, everyone. this is yes. Amy's point, that, that Liz Truss thinks tax cuts will fix everything, which perhaps, looking at these stories, they won't. Well, I think the really hard thing is, we've got to remember, is that uh, although this is being played out across all media, this, uh, this race, um, really, it's to 200,000 mm. Conservative members. Yes. So I think the messaging, you know, what we can't sit here and sort of just... It's not like an election where we're sort of going to vote on two different ideas. You know, Rishi or Liz Truss are both trying to just become the leader. It's voted for by the Conservative members. Mm -hmm. and, and sort of down the line, I, I see, I think if you asked most people out in the country who do you like, uh, for me, I kind of think Rishi slightly makes more sense because right now we've got big financial problems I would like someone, I don't care whether they're exciting, fun or full of charisma, as long as they're smart, honest and have an idea how to solve what are really big financial problems for all people in Britain, not just wealthy people or not just conservative people. You know, I, I think a lot of what he's saying for me makes sense. But obviously Liz Truss is trying to get the vote of those conservative members. Mm -hmm. And so we're just watching a really small election, really. But that person will happen to be the prime minister for all mm -hmm. of us. Well, that's right. You know, do we go for growth? That was the point made by uh, the conservative MP that I spoke to earlier in the show, um, who was the, uh, the serving Tory uh, MP for Dudley North, Marco Long. And that was his argument, is Liz Truss is going to drive economic growth, which yeah, fixes but how, everything. But how? Because I mean, what is the thing that she's going to do? Well, if you reduce taxes, doesn't that encourage investment, the hiring of staff, and people have got more money in their pocket to spend? Well, trickle-down economics, kind of trickle-down mm. economics, it's never worked, ever. There is no, there is no example of when trickle-down economics has worked. Although are high taxes not a drag on economic growth? If you think about what's happened, you can't just talk about high taxes in a vacuum of this week. Mm. You've got to think about what's been happening here for 10 years, 12, 15 years. We've had austerity. Austerity cut the, the budgets of all our social services. Those social services, you know, the NHS, well, there, is, there is no dentists, there's no GPs. Sure start went. Yeah, yeah, sure start went. Um, it's even difficult to... Uh, Get a, get a lawyer, you know, well, on, yeah, the on legal aid. The Justice Department saw 40 per cent. Yeah. Um, and then there's housing. Mm. Who hasn't got a problem with housing at the moment? Everyone has got a problem with housing. So if you think about our economy over the last 15 years and then you try and put it right with tax cuts rather than focusing on our society as a whole, then, no, I don't think you're going to get... I don't think you're going to get the growth. Because well, where is the growth going to come from? How is it going to...? You know, so I hear this from all the politicians. This, oh, we're going to get growth. But I don't know what that means because they're not saying. Mm. We don't know what that means. Tax cuts. Tax cuts won't do anything for um, elderly people with pensions. It will do nothing for disabled people. It will do nothing for the very lowest paid mm. because they're not paying that level of tax. So actually tax cuts, and I know that the rest of the country will want tax cuts, but if you think about austerity and what we've been through, 
we actually need good social services. And uh, speaking of which, uh, let's talk about uh, the Independent, who are very concerned in their latest report about food banks running out of stock yeah. as demand surges. Now, it's important, isn't it, not to catastrophise here, Lisa. Uh, we are seeing uh, huge demand for food banks across Western Europe, including very mm -hmm. rich countries like Germany. Uh, and, and I was just reading about Italian food banks earlier today yep. as well. So it's, it's a problem across the West. It is. It is, um, and it's a disgraceful problem mm. because none of these countries, uh, with you know, none of these countries should have food poverty. We shouldn't. We're what the sixth? Are we the sixth or the fifth? Um, the richest country in the world. We should not yeah. have food. We, yeah, we go between fifth so and six. six yeah. Yeah. Currently fifth, I believe. But we should not have a society. A good society would not have hungry working people, mm. and we have. Um, the food bank where I live uh, a few months ago completely ran out of food. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's it's a cruel irony. We had to people, do. We had to do go a... to food banks for food and yeah. And the food we had to do a campaign to get food to the food bank. Yeah. Um, and that was food to the food bank, to the people. We, this should not be now, happening. Now, Keir Starmer, uh, headline on the front page of the Metro, Freeze, Starmer throws down gauntlet by promising to block rise in energy bills, Lisa. £29 billion <laughs> aimed at trumping any offers from Tory leadership rivals. Where's that money going to come from? I don't know. I don't think he knows, really. I, I mean, to be honest, I'm shocked that he's actually on the front page of a newspaper. He's, he's, been, he's been absent. I don't know anything. What the, I don't know what Labour is supposed to be doing. I don't know what they want to do. There have been absolutely no opposition. I think what they've done, and it's a disgrace for an opposition party, is they have removed themselves from the debate and hope that the Tories will just sort of uh, kill each other. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and it's, it's, yeah. it's a disgraceful thing for an opposition party to do. We don't have an opposition. Of course, you can't have good politics and good government if you don't have a really effective opposition. No. I mean, we need debate. That's, you know, yeah. what we're doing now. You need this debate going on. And actually, I, but I think, you know, the reality is, uh, from everything you hear, the Labour Party, in a way, are just as much in turmoil internally as perhaps the Conservative Party are. So, actually, they don't necessarily have the solutions to the problems. It's been very easy over the last few years just literally just to, you know, watch the Tories slightly implode or, you know, watch Boris do something else slightly embarrassing, you know, and then just... just criticise them for that. They've actually had to not really come up with any solutions or ideas of their own, and that seems to be lacking. Well, Amy, what's your, what's your view of Keir Starmer? Because he has certainly made headlines in tomorrow's papers. Uh, the Mirror, of course, uh, pretty supportive of Starmer at the best of times anyway, uh, but they're, they're, running, uh, they're running this, this story. It's clearly, clearly come from the Labour Party that Labour would do more to tackle the cost of living crisis. Yeah. Freeze cruel bills now. Starmer's energy demand. Hard-hit families should not pay a penny more as schools fear a four-day week. Is this an opportunity for Keir Starmer to cut through? Again, completely agreeing with you. Um, he's kind of... He's almost trying to be positive uh, in a very, very hard situation, but he's not actually... He's not actually giving us the security of how he's going to do it, which I feel like mm. they all keep doing. Yeah. Because mm. uh, we're not stupid, are we? The no. public aren't stupid. My viewers no. are not stupid. No. And no. we know Agreed. that the country's broke. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, where's all this cash coming from? Mm. Yeah. I've, we have, you know, we're all panicking how we're going to pay our next bill, and at the same time, he's, set, he's kind of pulling... Twenty nine yeah. billion out of Think where? One of your guests earlier, Tim Montgomery, made a very good point in that sort of debate, saying, look, here are th two actually good candidates who have got lots of experience in government. Yeah. And what either of them, whoever wins, will have to do is actually have an honest mm. sort of a conversation with us, the people, because we're not oh, daft, nice. and just sort of go, look, this is not going to be easy. We've got some problems. Mm. It's not a quick fix. Um, there might be a bit of pain. But this is how we think we can do it long term. But, it, you know, the problem is now the way government, you've got two years till another elect, till the next election. And I think it's time to wean ourselves off Boris's uh, boosterism, yeah. which might have been welcome a couple of years ago. But we do need yeah. a few home truths now, don't we? We do. But I think those home truths need to be more truthful than perhaps they've ever been. And more painful. Well, not for everyone. I mean, you remember, do you remember George Osborne's, you know, we're all in this together? Mm. And we absolutely were not all in that together at all. The richest 10% increased their wealth through austerity. 
that was not all of us in together, all of us in this together. Mm -hmm. And if this happens the same way, you know, throughout um, the pandemic, the richest, I think the richest four percent, as again, oh, it, uh, it's exploded. Yeah, they've they've got richer. We and can't. Corporations got bigger yeah, as well. We can't keep doing this. So I want a home truth that's truth. Yeah. Well, <laughs> let's let's hope that uh, Liz Truss can do that. I mean, in defence of of her campaign and and, and her people and her message. Uh, her argument is that she doesn't want austerity 2.0 and that mm. probably what we should have done during the last financial crisis in 2010 was live with that extra debt and yeah. grow our way out of yes, it. Yeah. In the end, we, 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 we cut our way out of it, which I think yes. is a lesson learned. Do you think, do you think though, with Liz Truss, I'm going to ask you this, you know the, 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 the term that she keeps using of handouts, mm. it sounds wrong and it sounds mean mm. because... People's taxes are not... Uh, if, if they get rebates in tax, that's not a handout. That's their money coming back to them. And I just think the way that she keeps talking about giving handouts, I think the language is completely wrong. Uh, yeah, well, I think, uh, going back to what Neil Fox was saying, uh, that's clearly language aimed at this small but rather powerful constituency yeah. who yeah. have a vote in the race. Um, look, let's uh, discuss an interesting story in relation to the cost of living crisis. Um, in the past, it was common for families to rent televisions and other electrical appliances. Well, Hughes Rental have been in business for more than a century and have seen a 20% leap in demand for major appliances in the last couple of years. So as we pinch the pennies, is uh, renting appliances a good way to tackle the cost of living crisis? Uh, Amy, you won't have a clue about this. <laughs> well, no, I've done my research. We've had but, some but chats. You won't have, it won't be, to use that terrible term, it won't be your lived experience because you're, no. you're, you're young. And, and I can tell you, I'm old enough to remember my dad, he rented our telly. It was a Hitachi, and it actually it looked like a piece of furniture. It was actually in, encased in wood oh, nice. with a kind of folding door that opened yeah, yeah. when you wow. wanted to watch the telly. It started with three channels, then there were four. God, I'm old. Uh, but we had that thing, and I think my dad paid £4 a month for it. Um, wow. Those were the days. When I was a struggling student, we rented our fridge because the new one was 300. Well, I think that's yeah. great. I think it's fantastic that that's even offered to people mm -hmm. um, to rent appliances. Mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely great. You're not tied in... Because most places when you buy furniture and you can pay sort of monthly so yeah. you don't have to give that but you are contracted to finish the payment yeah, yeah. so yes. at least yeah. with renting if you think oh my god next month i can't afford our tv yeah have it back yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, when i was yeah, a student yeah. i think that 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 um that fridge was nine quid a month and it was split between six which is pretty cost efficient. yeah, yeah. not bad at all yeah. 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 Did, did you rent i mean you were no I, but we were just saying beforehand well, yeah, well, look, cars on HP, your phones yeah, on it. Yeah. We, we have a lot of things we have that we do pay monthly for. Mortgages, OK? So, yeah. But actually, we in this... We, when I was a kid growing up, you, there was companies like uh, Rumbelows and Rediffusion. Rediffusion. The yeah. Radio uh, rentals. Radio yeah, rentals, yeah. of course, on the high street. It was a very common thing to yeah. rent like, like you did, you know, yeah. rent your TV. We had and our telly rented yeah. from Rediffusion. Yeah. Rediffusion. It used to have a, to have a, tur a turn... At, you used to turn it over in a box on the windowsill. There you go. Well, there's Flash for you. All these memories are so much more to come. Another game show. And so I'll see you in two. Oh, I'm rubbish. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrow. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. 
I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. So this is my last Mark Dolan tonight. Until the start of September, the brilliant Beverly Turner will be in charge. Unfortunately, she's not as pretty as me, but she's a damn good broadcaster. Uh, so do join her then. I'm back on the 2nd of September. I'll miss you hugely. I've been here for a year. It's the best job I've ever had. And I cannot wait to get back on air on Friday the 2nd. A brand new show on Saturday. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Mark Dolan tonight, 9 till 11. Saturday night, a brand new show called Dial Dolan from 8 till 9 p.m. If you want to join me for an hour of video calls about the big stories of the day, then drop me a personal email right now. Mark at gbnews.uk and make yourself a star on Dial Dolan. First show, 8 p.m. on the 3rd of September. We're making TV history. A 70-year-old millionaire has been jailed for refusing to pull down his man cave. It contained a squash court, gym, cinema, bowling alley, classic car collection, swimming pool, casino, and much more. He's uh, now facing six weeks in prison and is still being told to pull it down. So what would you have in your man or woman cave? How about you, Neil? Have you got one already? No, I haven't. Look, I, I definitely have uh, some classic old pinball machines. I'd have a classic uh, jukebox in there. When I left Capital Radio, they bought me a Harley Davidson jukebox, which is fantastic. Nice. Uh, and I'd have just a load of great old bikes and bike parts and tools. That, oh, that God, would that, would, that would do it. And an old leather sofa that could smell of oil. Blimey, I'd love to be part of that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I could bring my little 125 scooter. You can do an oil change. Uh, how about you, Amy? What would be in your, uh, in your lady den? I would have a massive roller disco. Oh, how are you talking? <laughs> and a bar, obviously a bar, obviously. Oh, I'm worried about the, the booze and the roller disco. That's no, a dangerous don't worried, combo. Don't be worried. You'll have the knee pads. Oh, my gosh. Oh, well, look, we're so up against it for time. But very quickly, what's in your lady cave? <laughs> which like sounds that. obscene, by the way. I know it does. That's why I keep... Family <laughs> show. <laughs> I know. Don't, don't show me what's in your lady cave, No, I'm, I, would Lisa. I would never do that. <laughs> I like the bar. <laughs> yeah, me too. You had me at bar. Well, we're going to play a very fun game. Uh, that's right. Uh, tonight's game is all about identifying the famous room or cave. We'll play Space Invader. And here's famous room number one. White House. The White, White House. House. It is. And what's the room called? The Oval Office. Oval Office. Yeah. Well done. Come on. That's OK. Awesome. And then how about our next one? Here's our famous room. Friends. Uh, friends, of course. Well done. Uh, then the next uh, next uh, famous space. Simpsons. Oh, you're good at this. Yeah, You've all watched too much telly. Uh, <laughs> let's have another look at that one. Look at this den. Oh, oh this is... Uh, is this something to... Is this 007? No, Doctor he's got a very special black car and he can fly. Batman. Oh, is it Batman? Yes, indeed. Batman's Batcave. How about this one? This is spooky and futuristic. Um, Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Yes. Chamber of Secrets. Yes. How about this one? Gorgeous. Hall of Mirrors in the Palace of Versailles. Yes. Uh, and last but not least, on a sexy note, we've got time. <laughs> the Red Room. Oh, it's ah. Fifty Shades. Fifty Shades. Um, thank you for your company. It's been an amazing weekend, an amazing year. It's nothing without you. I'll see you on the 2nd of September. Have a great time. Looking ahead to tomorrow's weather and the UK is looking rather unsettled at times with some heavy thundery showers. Let's look at the details. Heavy showers will continue in Scotland tomorrow with some thundery downpours in places. A yellow thunderstorm warning is in force. Thunderstorms are also possible in Northern Ireland overnight and into Monday morning. The heavy downpours could lead to some localised flooding in places. It will be a drier start in northern England with some bright spells. However, there will be a few light showers around too. A warm start to the day with temperatures in the high teens. A few showers are likely to start the day in parts of Wales. Perhaps the odd heavy burst at times too. For many, it should stay largely dry. The day will start at around 20 degrees in places. A dry start to the day across the Midlands with some hazy sunshine, feeling warm in the morning with temperatures in double figures. Dry and bright in the morning across East Anglia, temperatures will quickly rise in the humid air, although it will be a little less hot compared to the weekend. 
Much of southern England will have a warm and dry start to the day, but there could be a few heavy showers in the southwest. Temperatures will quickly rise in the south through Monday morning, triggering some heavy and thundery downpours. It'll be cooler in the north, with some thundery showers possible here too. And that's how the weather's shaping up during tomorrow morning. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your...